watched a baby cry. Like really watched a baby's body while she's crying. Her lungs, her ribcage expands and contracts, expands and contracts, and her belly, full with breath, rises and falls and rises and falls. And her arms, her arms are a clear extension of her heart. Her mouth is wide open and her voice just flies out of it. It flies out of it without apology. But her voice is not separate from her body. Her voice is her body. Her body is her voice. That baby is showing up 100% in the room with voice and breath and heart and body. She is speaking truth to power and making change happen. I believe that all bodies, grown-up bodies, all of our grown-up bodies still have the capacity for that fullness of expression, the capacity and the longing for that fullness of expression, for that depth of presence. I'd like to introduce you to my body. This is my body. I have a body. I am a body. In spite of the cultural messages that have been hammered into my female body, my body takes up space. This is my face. This is the face of a 54-year-old woman. 55 tomorrow. <laughs> Sometimes people tell me I look young for my age, as if that would be something to celebrate, as if looking my age would be problematic, which would then mean that being my age is problematic. As far as I can tell, being alive on the planet is a splendid and wondrous thing. So if my body actually shows that I've been alive on the planet more years rather than less years, then I say, hallelujah. I have these two deep wrinkles in the center of my forehead. Make me look angry, even when I'm not angry. But the truth is, I'm angry. I'm angry. I'm angry that the female body has been a battleground. I'm angry that we, as women, have been systematically trained by that complex web that is capitalism and sexism. We've been systematically trained to believe that there is something wrong with our bodies. Whatever the shape or size or color or texture, there is very definitely something wrong and we have to spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of our precious attention making it right. I'm angry about the enormous profit that is generated because we buy into that story. And I'm angry about the women's voices and stories that have buried, been buried and lost inside those bodies. This is my face. These are my legs. These are my legs. My legs. I haven't shaved my legs in 30 years. <laughs> when I was 25, my boyfriend Will asked me why I shaved my legs. And I said, because I love the smooth, silky feeling of crawling into the sheets at night. And he said, did you know that in World War I, when Gillette realized it lost all its customers to war, they created an ad campaign and told the story to women that the hair on their legs and under their arms was unsightly. And with that story, they created a whole new crop of customers. I haven't shaved my legs since then. I'm rewriting the story for myself that Gillette wrote for women 100 years ago. And it still feels really good crawling under the sheets at night. These are my arms. My strong arms, these arms have 
moved 40 foot ladders and they've pushed wheelbarrows full of dirt and they've swum me across lakes and rivers. They've held lovers and babies and groceries. But for years, I wouldn't wear a tank top. I wouldn't wear a tank top because I believed my arms weren't quite skinny enough to let the world see them. But you want to know what I can do now? Yeah. <laughs> These are my arms. These are my breasts, my beloved breasts, my girls. <laughs> my breasts came in late. They came in like centuries, centuries after all the other girls got breasts. But I remember that blessed day, that blessed day when I felt the little pea sprout. Do you remember the day? I was so excited that I finally had a boob. <laughs> but excitement quickly gave way to shame. And I hunched my shoulders over, and I let my t-shirt hang loose, and I went through the world like this. Because I didn't want anybody to know that I had a body. This. This is my belly, my belly. My belly is soft and full and round. And when I stop sucking it in, when I stop sucking it in and breathe, really breathe, not only do I get more connected to my vocal power and my breath, not only do I get to enjoy the sensual delight of living in a body, but I get to take a stand against the relentless pressure to suck it in, to make it just a little bit smaller, just a little bit flatter, just a little bit skinnier, so I can take up just a little less space. But when I suck my belly in, I can't breathe. And when I can't breathe, I can't talk. And when I can't talk, I can't speak truth to power. This is my belly. This is my vulva. My fancy bits, my hoo-ha, my happy valley, my velvet Volvo, my JJ, my vertical smile. When I was eight, I was in a playground with my sister and my best friend. It was a Saturday, we were the only ones in the playground, except for a man. And he called us behind the building, the school building, one at a time. And because we were good girls, we did what we were told. Later on in the police car, when the policeman asked us what happened, my sister said, I held my pants on, he didn't touch me. And my best friend said, I held my pants on, he didn't touch me. So when it was my turn, I said, I held my pants on. He didn't touch me. But the truth is, he did touch me. He touched me in ways no little girl should be touched. And in that moment, when I decided not to tell, I tucked a little part of my voice way down deep into the dark crevices of my body. And I kept it there. And I stayed good and quiet and well behaved. And I did everything I could to take up as little space as possible. But the good news is, the good news is that part of my voice is still there. It didn't go anywhere. 
It didn't go anywhere. Our bodies are houses. Our bodies are holding places for the stories we haven't told yet. For the parts of our voices that didn't have a soft landing pad, it's all there. And right next to that story of trauma is the story of genius. And we tend to hide those stories just as much as we hide those secret shame stories, but it's all there. It's all there. It's all in the body. It's all in my body. It's all in our bodies in every wrinkle, in every shadowy fold. And if it's true, if it's true that our bodies are houses for our stories, and if it's true that just like that baby, our bodies are our voices, then when we hate on, when we hate on and shame and judge, and tuck and tweak and squeeze and pluck and hide and cover and apologize for our bodies, not only are we buying into that misogynistic story that there's something wrong with our bodies, but we're cutting ourselves off from our voices. We're cutting ourselves off from the stories that make us who we are. We're cutting ourselves off from our deepest power. I'm not suggesting there's only one, one way to be in a body. I'm not suggesting everybody stop shaving their legs and stop working out and stop wearing makeup. I'm all for health and vitality. I'm all for empowered beautification and creative expression with and of and from and through our bodies. But I want us to do it on our terms. Our terms. I want us to insist that we do it on our terms. And I get that that's no easy task. It's no easy task because the story that is told about the female body, the story that is on billboards and screens and is woven so, so, so deeply into the fabric of our culture, the story that the female body should be objectified and controlled, if not by them, then certainly by us. That's a powerful story. It's so powerful we can't even imagine. We can't even fathom how deeply it runs. It's in the air we breathe. And in lockstep with the patriarchy, we tell that story to ourselves every time we look in the mirror in judgment, in disgust. We tell that story to our sisters when we say, ah, oh, she shouldn't be wearing that. And in spite of our best intention, we tell that story to our daughters. But I know, I know, we know, the stories that live here are way more powerful than that old story. So when we, when instead of turning towards the mirror in judgment, we turn towards the inherent wisdom in our bodies, and we turn towards one another in solidarity and sisterhood, and we tell our stories, and we let our genius shine, that's how the power structures, the power structures that have told us all these lies about our body, that's how they crumble. That's how it crumbles. It needs us to be separate from one another. It needs us to hate our bodies and to spend all our time and money and precious attention trying to fix them. It needs us to believe our stories don't matter, our voices don't matter. And they do, they do. They do, they do, they do, they do, they do. And our voice, my voice, our voices, it doesn't live here. It's not here. It's here. Our voices live here and here and here and here. Right? So will you join me now? Will you join me now in unsucking your belly? 
Unsuck your belly. Right now, you can do it. Unsuck your belly. And if for you it's not your belly, but your ass or your elbow, or wherever, wherever, wherever the patriarchy has taken up residence in your body, go there now. Go there now, really, right now. If you're willing, put your hand there and say with reverence, reverence and care, this, this is my body. This is my, my sacred, holy, wise, wise, messy, resilient, beautiful body. This body has a voice. This body is a voice. This body has stories to tell, and the world needs to hear them. I don't know. I don't know what things are going to look like post-patriarchy. But I do know. I do know we're going to need every voice, every body, every story, every single body, fully in the room, just like that baby with breath and heart and voice, speaking truth to power, making change happen. <laughs>